You know, the, the interesting thing to me is how AI is potentially changing how you transfer on software development. And how do you think about applying AI as you're a leader and trying to influence how this complex adaptive system is evolving versus how do you do AI as a developer? And I'm seeing a lot of the stuff focused around what do you do with AI as a developer and not so much about, you know, as I'm a leader of an organization and I'm trying to, maybe I've got a bunch of products and I got a bunch of branches and I want to abstract from the product definitions. Can I use AI to analyze my software code that's really hard to see and figure out and figure out where you're going around the APIs in such a way that forces me to branch for the different code things? Are there things where, gee, I want to move to the cloud. Where am I making calls directly to the hardware? Can I analyze that? Can I monitor that? Can I make sure that doesn't happen? What are the things that are slowing me down? And one of the things that, you know, I've always kind of come with this idea that, you know, if I go into a large organization that's mainly releasing code with manual testing, how do you, how do you move forward? And the worst kind of tests to write are system tests because they're hard to maintain, they're difficult to deal with, and hard to, and, and ideally you should have unit tests that are better for the developer, they give you better feedback, easier to be de de debug and do all those sorts of things. But if I'm a large organization, and so as an engineer, I want to take the system test approach and I want to do all that. But as a leader, how long is it going to take for me to put enough you know, unit testing in place to enable me to turn off the manual testing? So I've all, always come to the conclusion that you know, the first and most important thing you need to do is learn how to work in smaller batch sizes that don't have the overhead yeah. with all the debug and triage. And so ideally, you want to remove manual testing as a quality gate. It's yeah. not that you'd still do it for exploratory or usability or all those sorts of different yeah. things, but don't use it as a gate in your release process. And to do that, you need to kill the manual system tests you've been doing. And the easiest way to do that is through automating the system tests. But then there was this interesting paper by Meta where they went in and had AI write unit tests for legacy code. And 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 they 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 did it a couple of ways. One, they sort of said, create unit tests and then sort of throw it away if it doesn't build and compile. And then two, throw it away if it doesn't pass. And and so they did some things like that to filter it back. But it's like, well, wait a minute. Could AI really automate unit tests to the point where I don't and, and it's not the way you'd want to write them when you're writing the code. But if you've got a large legacy application, you're trying to figure out how to modernize it. Or can it, or, and there was another thing that was really interesting. Martin Fowler wrote with the ThoughtWorks person out of China that says, when you use AI, just don't tell it to do something. Start with a stepwise approach and iteration where you ask it, how would you approach this problem? Mm -hmm. And then you do some feedback and iteration with AI and then you respond to that. And then, okay, now that I agree that that is the way I design it, that's the way I approach it, now can you do this step? So, you know, if, if, if I've got a bunch of manual tests that are done system tests, okay, given all these manual tests, how would you approach writing the Gherkin type code for this? Yeah. And then once I've got good code like that, I've done it for a few, then could that scale and quickly go across? It may not be ready yet, but it's it's moving quickly, and you know I, I I'm I'm talking to engineers all the time about what's working, and you know one point it's like oh it's terrible I can't stand it it's not working. Five weeks later, it's saying well it's actually working pretty good. Yeah. And I even had an engineer go to talk to me the other day. So he's like, you know, I found that if I'm polite to it, it works better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Gee, that was a really nice job. I really liked the way you did that. It, what yeah. if we try? <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, says, he says it's weird. It should really work, but but it seems I seem to get better results with a dice. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I'm I'm a bit skeptical about some of that in terms of the role of AI uh, for, for, from from a testing point of view. I, I'm nervous that what what AI can 
only possibly do if we just kind of point it at a code base and say, test this. All it can do is assert that the code's doing what the code's doing. And that's not what we really want. We want to know that the code's doing the right things. And there's no way that the AI can know what the right things are without some form of human input. I definitely think, I think that one of the directions that's really interesting is that as we get to more, as we get to more advanced versions of the kind of AI tools, what, what we'll end up with, I think, I hope, is that we effectively will raise the level of abstraction of programming so that we'll be programming by defining specifications for the behavior that we want of the system, which probably will look a bit like some of those gherkin things uh, and say, we want the software to do this. We want the software to achieve this. And then the AI fills in the gaps and make it, makes it do that. But I'm not, I'm nervous about the, you know, the use of AI in legacy systems because there are other techniques that allow us to do that and we don't need AI for. But 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 they're, but they're more limited in terms of, it seems to me. But it's an inter- it's an interesting problem. And, and as you say, the AI stuff is moving so quickly. I mean, I'm involved with a few people that are doing some interesting things uh, with AI and looking into it for for a variety of different reasons. Um, and it's obvious. It's pretty obvious that it's going to be a huge player. I, I'm also intrigued by the thing that you said about. What are the AI tools that help lead the leaders, the leadership? It's it's not just a technical problem. Um, so what what how how do we how do we facilitate this? And, and partly maybe it is about that raising the level of abstraction of programming to the level where it can just say, I want uh, you know a trading system that will give me this result. <laughs> and then some, some, something generates that that isn't a person. I think we're along with, I, yes, you could use AI to sort of say, create this and then create something and kick it out. But you'd probably die under the weight of maintaining it. Yeah, 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 yeah ab- absolutely. That's, that's also a big problem. I think that one of the huge things that's missing, that's kind of implicit in nearly all that we've said this afternoon is, you know, We've been, you and I have been talking in some detail about the importance and the value of incremental change. We've been talking about how vital it is to make progress in small steps. And whatever the mental capacity that we have, one of the advantages of being able to make progress in small steps is if my head's this big, then I can only conceive a problem that's kind of that large. But if I can do break a problem down into a series of small steps, I can do that large, then that large, then that large, then that large, and add to it. AI doesn't currently work like that because it can't go back and rework. AI currently, we say, do this thing, and it does it. It generates all of it in one big step, and that means there's well, a limit on, on on how big the AI can get. Even if AI can get a thousand times smarter than us, it you can only build systems that are a thousand times smarter than us. But I think that Martin Fowler paper gets past that a little bit, which is you don't say, give me X. You start with, how would you approach this problem? And as a good, experienced software developer, you iterate on that until you've got an approach that works. And then you sure, say... Uh, sure, sure. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I, I, again, I'm skeptical in that I, I don't think that goes far enough because... you. Know, one of the th- I've got a video coming up on my YouTube channel on on this topic, but one of the things that I think that we're in danger of discarding is is the incrementalism, the ability to sustain incrementalism, because currently the current generation of AI code generation tools aren't reproducible, so we don't we we're not able to build on what we know works. Because every time, every time we ask the AI to give us a result, even given the same input parameters, the same specifications, we get a different result every time. Yeah. So, 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 not, so that limits incrementalism. But, yeah. but HP, I was so focused on making developers more productive. I was buying them larger screens. I was buying them the yeah, yeah. headsets. I think if you're a leader in an organization it, that isn't having your organization experiment and learn and adjust oh. with it, you, you 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 should you should be questioning why you're getting paid. Uh, no, I, absolutely, hundred percent. I, I, I'm not I'm not trying to 
I'm not trying to downgrade the utility of the AR tools. I, 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 I think they are important, and I, I, do, I am convinced that they're only going to get better than they are now, and one day they'll be doing all of the coding. But at the moment, I, I think there are limitations on what we're doing, and I think that some of the approaches to applying them are, to be frank, somewhat naive. I, I don't think they'll be replacing software engineers. I think they'll be making software engineers more productive. And I don't think you, I don't think, I think AI is a long ways out from ever writing software. It, it, well, so if you, if you think of this example of, I go through a bunch of iterations and tell it's writing good Gherkin code for me and it can look mm -hmm. at my manual test and write good Gherkin code. I would think it's not that hard to write the step definitions to, and, and so that repetitive work of writing the step definitions is something that could, but every time it kicks it out, I want, I want a design review by a good quality engineer that looks for the weaknesses. And I don't want to sort of say, do it for the whole thing. I want to say, let's do some small iterations until we get this working right. And then give me a bunch of feedback and then let's try to scale it out a little bit. But I think it's a, it's a human in the loop approach as opposed to AI is going to do something. And we're not looking to replace engineers. We're looking to make them more productive. Uh, I, 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 I think that's going to be true. I think that's practically true for more difficult systems for a long time. But I think the dystopian view, we're already down that track somewhere. That, you know, there's, there's data that's saying that the, the, the quality of software is going down with the application of AI because people aren't doing that checking. And there are a lot of the tools, they're not designed with that sort of checking in mind. And, and I would go back to the stuff that we were talking about is the use of automated testing as a tool, from my point of view, as an engineering discipline to, to drive the change you know, is part of exerting that kind of tr control over these things. Yeah. And, and I want to be writing my unit tests when I'm writing my code. Yeah. Right? It, it's, it's just... What, how do I deal with something that I'm never going to go back and write those unit tests on just because it's been around for long and, and the value of yeah. writing unit tests goes way down when the code's already written. Yeah. yeah. So I, it's going to be interesting to see how it evolves. I, I think it's the, it's a human in the loop thing, but boy, it, 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 the thing I don't see is how's AI being used by leaders to help me understand how this complex adaptive system is evolving? And I that's think absolutely that's true. And, yeah, and I, it's, that's an interesting area. I, I, I don't know, I have no clue what those tools would even look like to be able to do that. And, and, and nobody's focused on it, right? And, and absolutely. they're all focused on the latest, greatest thing that AI can do and all these yeah, sorts yeah. of things. And the change in the impact it's gonna have for software development is more on the adoption and uh, by people that are that are running businesses, not by open AI and those different things. And so yeah. those people need to understand what it's gonna do and they need to understand, they need to be influencing how the tools evolve and what they're gonna be doing. And, and I just have not found the spot where that conversation is going on with AI. No, I, I think perhaps one of the one of the areas that might be interesting to explore for somebody in that space is maybe around the metrics that we were talking about before that are so important in terms of steering your change and, and figuring out whether your change is working or not. Yeah, monitoring how systems evolve. I mean, yeah. it, it'd be great if you had a really good AI system that was that was optimizing your A-B testing. Yeah, yeah which absolutely. Being used, yeah. Which code isn't being used and, you know. Yeah. Did this feature make me money? <laughs> yeah. yeah, none of this code's been used for like three years. Should we still yeah, yeah. test it and release it every cycle, or should we get rid of it? Yeah, I, there's, there's certainly some work being done on that. So, so um, Adam Tornhill, who, uh, who who runs a company called Code Scene, is has tools that do some of that stuff, which is doing that kind of analysis based on um, your version control system and your your change history. It's interesting stuff, but um, yeah, it. it <laughs> 
what's the Chinese proverb? Maybe we live in interesting times. Right. <laughs> yeah. and, 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 and the interesting, it, it's changing so fast. It's just hard to, uh, it's, for an old guy like me, it's hard to keep up with. <laughs> yeah, and I think I'm probably older than you. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. Uh, it's been it's been a delight talking to you, Gary. It, it's been a lot yeah. of fun. This clip was taken from my podcast, The Engineering Room with Dave Farley a monthly podcast with some of the brightest minds in software engineering. You can find full episodes on all your favorite podcast platforms, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Amazon Music. Your support helps us to bring the, you these regular episodes, so please leave your positive review on your preferred podcast platform to help us to continue to grow and bring you great guests and their insights. Thank you very much for listening.